they wanted to or as much as they would because they couldn't. So $23,000 in a time like that is helpful. And so I can understand why Ted would want it, his wife to hear, amen, <laughs> to, give, to give. So he's like, well, Lord, you're going to have to talk to my wife. Well, I've never, for up to that day, I'd never known his wife to hear anything concerning finances. <laughs> Not to give it away anyhow, amen. <laughs> now, I, uh, I, I, I'd never known her to hear nothing about giving anything away. In fact, every other time Ted ever went to do something financially as far as giving an offering, she was always resistant and always opposed him every time before that day, every time. So she comes home, she lays hands. He says, you need to pray for me. The Lord's dealing with me about something. You need to pray for me. She lays hands on him. She's, she begins to quote Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom with the same measure you meet out. It shall be measured unto you again. Well, when she said that, she's prophesying and didn't know it, you know. He's like, amen, I'll do it. He says, you confirmed it. I'm going to do it. She said, do what? <laughs> he said, well, you just prophesied it. I told the Lord I needed for you to confirm it. I needed for you to be in agreement for me to give $14,000. 14000 out of 23. 14000 out of 23 that was much needed, and they didn't know whether any more was coming. For all they knew, that's the last $23,000 they were ever going to receive. Boy, y'all ain't hearing this today. Because, see, that's, that's really where we pass the test, church. Turn to someone, tell them, you got to pass the test. That's really, amen. I received that in the name of Jesus. That's really where we got to pass the test. Is in that moment that God calls upon us to do something that in the natural really is a, a struggle and a hardship and looks as if in the natural it would cause us a suffering. So Ted was obedient and, and uh, in fact he, he called me up. He said, I'm going to be obedient. The Lord told me I'm supposed to give $14,000 into the ministry. When are you going to come pick it up? <laughs> well, I wasn't about to pick anything up because we attended, this, Ted and I attended this, the, the same church. I was on staff at that church, and already they thought Ted and my relationship was a bit strange. <laughs> and so I knew that if Ted gave me that money, that they would think that somehow or another I had something to do with pulling some strings to try to get that money out there. Knowing that his family was in need and that his family was struggling. See, the church has this idea and, and, and this is true in, in a lot of churches. The church has this idea that if your family's struggling and you're enduring hardships, then you better examine what you're doing and find out what you're doing wrong and get it fixed. And how many times have we, how many times have we said that to people? Hey, man, you better get it fixed. You know, you better get it straight before God. That's what, that's what happened with Job. Remember when Job started losing all of his stuff and things went haywire in Job's life? What did people tell him? Boy, you better find out what you did wrong before God. You better fix it. Well, you know what? Job hadn't done anything wrong before God. He hadn't sinned. He hadn't offended God. In fact, he was one of, he was one of God's favorites. Man, you must have fallen out of favor. You must have gotten off... You must have gotten off course. You better fix it. How many times do we look at churches that are struggling and say, you know, if they would fix it, everything would be okay? How many times have we looked at preachers that were struggling and said, you know, if he'd get some things straight in his life, I reckon everything would be all right. Maybe he ought to find out what's broken. How many times have we looked at our neighbor or looked at someone? And, and, and of course, we make these judgments. They're, they're probably not spending their money right. They're not managing their money right. You know, if they do this right, if they do that right, if they do this other right. And some of us don't stop to consider that some people are in the condition that they're in, not because they've done something wrong or something stupid, but because they've been willing to obey God and do what God commanded them to do. And the Lord required something more from them than what, they, than what others were willing to do. You know, I reckon that God probably 
uh, it, God, that the only one, uh, that Ted isn't the only one that God has probably talked to about doing something like that. I reckon that God has probably tried to call upon others to do that, and there were far less that were willing to do it than the, amen. But you know, yeah, and that's why I believe that God, it's difficult for God to find those that he can entrust with big money. Because when he's pulled on them in the hard time, amen. See, we, we consider ourselves more than we consider him. We consider ourselves more than we consider others. We, you know, we talk about the Bible and, and doing for others as we'd have them do unto us. But you know, that's as far as it goes. We just talk about it. We never, we don't really believe that. Who would do that? Well, I'll tell you, Jesus did. Amen. And that's really what he's, and that's really what he's asking for, from, from us. And we say, well, you know, we, we, we do it, and then we pee and moan and complain about it all the time. And, you know, I've been waiting on my heart. I've been trying. Boy, I've been trying. Y'all need to pray for me. <laughs> Anyhow, Ted's like, <laughs> I, I'll take it a little long, but. Ted's like, Brother Zeke, come get this. I'm like, I ain't coming over there and getting that. I didn't want to be persecuted. I'm like, you know what? I said, Ted, you need to pray about this. <laughs> He's like, I have prayed. I said, you need to pray longer. Because I'm not sure that's the will of God. Look at your family. He's like, I prayed about it. I know what I'm supposed to do. I was like, well, I'm going to let you pray about it for a little while longer. <laughs> I don't want to be persecuted. So for three months, I wouldn't receive that from Ted. I wouldn't receive it as an, I wouldn't receive an offering from Ted for three months. And after three months, one day I was in prayer, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, he said, quit being the boulder in the stream. He said, quit being the kink in the hose. He said, you are the holdup on the blessing that I'm trying to get across to Ted, he says, because you will not receive what I commanded him to do. He said, so you need to receive it, and take the kink out of the hole. I was like, well, Lord, people are going to persecute me. He's like, and? So I called Ted that morning. I said, Ted, I said, um, the Lord really spoke to you about that offering. He said, yes. I said, well, I'll receive it in the name of Jesus. Man, he started crying on the phone, shouting. He drove to my house right then and picked me up, drove me to the bank, the bank that his wife worked at. <laughs> he drags me into the bank by the arm. He gets his wife off of her desk in the middle of the day, drags her to the counter with me in tow. We want to withdraw $14,000 cash. Out of the 23 that we have in there, they didn't have 23 no more because they had to pay up all them insufficiency and stuff. They was, they was in arrears in areas. And so uh, they're like, what? Yes, give us 14,000. And so they counted it out in $100 bills. They took that big old wad of cash and handed it to Ted and his wife. They both grabbed it together. And in the bank, in the bank. Is this working? In the bank. Say in the bank. In front of the world. In front of the church. In front of the angels. In front of God. In front of Jesus. In front of the devil. In front of everybody. In front of everybody. They turned around from, listen, they turned around from that counter. I mean, it was just like this. They turned around like this. They both grabbed hold of the money. Ted's getting the... <laughs> Debbie's just a crying. And they said, we're being a blessing to you and to your ministry in obedience to him in the name of Jesus. Now lay hands on us and pray that this seed will produce a harvest. And I'm like, here they're like, 
Yes! I laid hands on him in the middle. Of, listen, I was, we was backing up the line. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I declare a harvest on this seed sown. God, they're being obedient to you. Lord, they're doing what you commanded them to do. Of course, those people in that bank thought they were flakier than a two-crust pie, and they thought I was Jim Jones, you know. But I prayed, and Ted, Ted's like, woo-hoo, woo-hoo, sha la la boo la ba woo hoo ha ha And his wife got her hands up just praising God and talking in tongues. And we walked out of that bank that day. Do you know it wasn't two weeks later before Ted got another check? One was for like $50,000, and then he got another one for like $35,000 a couple weeks after that. It was supernatural. We, we could, we, listen, you want to talk about shouting. You want to talk about being, being vindicated. Now, see, now, you, what do you reckon Ted did when he got that other money? Listen, Ted had already learned his lesson. Say this with me. Say, God first, God first. Other, second, other second, self last. Self last. Oh, we're in there right now. God first, other second, and self last. He got that money, and one day, can I give you one more testimony? One day, I was on staff at an Assembly God Church. I was a youth pastor, associate pastor at that church. I had an office there at the church, and I was trying to get a halfway decent desk. The desk that I had, I had to put two hymnals under one side of it just to keep the thing, you know. I mean, if you, if you didn't, everything rolled off, you know, off of one side. So, you know, I had to prop it up, and I had this old, ugly, beat-up chair, you know. It smelled like four youth pastors, uh, you know. <laughs> Twice dead and plucked up by the roots, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, I'm, I, you know, I, Ted, Ted knew, you know, we... we I would go and, and, and look at, Ted and I, we did a lot of dreaming together. And so one day, I walk into my office, and there sits this beautiful uh, desk, uh, executive desk. And it looked exactly like the desk that I, that I wanted. I was like, ooh. And at first, I thought, Pastor must have gotten a new desk, and I inherited his old desk. But then when I, when I went and looked at it, I could smell of the wood, and I'm like, no, that ain't an old desk, that's a new desk. I thought, they delivered the desk to the wrong office, you know. Someone trying to bless Pastor with a new desk. I was like, well, I better go in and find out from Pastor what he wants me to do. So I go into Pastor's office, I was like, Pastor, I said, I think somebody blessed you with a brand new desk. They put it in my office. He said, no, he said, that's not true. I was like, yes, sir. I was like, uh, that, there's, he's, uh, that, there's a desk in there. I said, it's brand new. It's a beautiful executive desk. He said, well, he said, it's not mine. I said, well, whose is it then? He says, well, it's yours. I was like, well, praise God. I was like, thank you, Pastor. He says, oh, no, don't thank me. I was like, well, I said, well, who do I have to thank for this? I said, did the church decide they was going to gonna buy me a desk or what? He's like, are you kidding? No. <laughs> He's like, he says, I've been sworn to secrecy, not to tell you. He said, but somebody brought you that desk because they wanted to be a blessing to you. I was like, well, praise God. So I went back in there, and I sat behind that desk in that old chair that smelled like three dead youth pastors. And, and I sat behind that desk, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm opening up the drawers. I even found me some pencils to put in that middle drawer, you know, just because it didn't have nothing in it yet. I'm like, threw some pencils in there. I'm like, yeah, baby, thank you, Jesus, you know. And so I was like, well, all right, I had to go someplace else. So I got I, I, behind the desk. I told, I told Pastor, I said, I said, now all I need is that, that, that nice leather ox blood executive chair uh, to roll up behind that thing. I said, glory to God. I said, that, I said, that'd be the fulfillment of a dream. And he's like, well, you know, he said, anything could happen. I was like, yeah. So I said, well, I'm out of here. I'll be back here in a few. And I start walking out the front door. And I see Ted's truck pulled up outside. And I'm like, well, Ted's here. Maybe he'll, you know, tag along with me. So I'm getting ready to walk out of the, the, the office had two different sections. 
I'm walking through one section, getting ready to go out into the, uh, into the outer office where everybody had to sit to wait to be uh, buzzed into the inner, you know, the outer court. <laughs> and then there's the inner court. And, and so anyway, so <laughs> I, I, as I walk in there, Ted comes through the doors and he's pushing this leather ox blood chair, executive chair in the door. And I open up the door, I'm like, what are you doing with that? He goes, you caught me. <laughs> so he rolls that chair to me. He says, that's from Jesus, brother. I was like, it was you. And he's like, he said, no, brother, it's from Jesus. Dude, bless me with a desk and a chair. Not only that, he rolls up one day with a laptop computer and puts it on my desk. That's back in the day when laptop computers were four or $5,000. Are y'all hearing me today? I know a lot of people that they envy where Ted's at financially, but they don't have any idea about the priority that he set in his life to ensure that God's blessing. Amen. Now, you know, I know there's some people like, eh, I don't want to hear it. Well, you know, stay poor. I don't care. <laughs> stay broke. But you don't have to be broke another day in your life. Amen. If, if you'll did now, now listen. Now listen, because it's important that you, hear, you understand this. I'm not telling you that you're going to come out of poverty tomorrow and into, into wealth. I reckon that some of you are going to have to endure the tests and you're going to have to go through some things and it'll be necessary. It'll be necessary for many of you to go through and there's a reason for it so that you'll remember the Lord your God. So that you'll remember that it was Him and that it wasn't you. Amen. Glory to God. But there, there are many that they, they just won't go through. Uh, they, they get mad at me. They get mad at preachers. And, Why does he spend so much time on that? Because you're broken. You need to, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people that are broke. And you need broke out. And you're not going to get broke out by someone giving you some little sermonette, you know, s sermonettes for Christianettes. For Christianettes. We've, we've, we've been satisfied with little sermonettes concerning finance. Uh, nothing, we don't want anything that ruffles our feathers or anything prolonged, you know. Anything that really you have to really dig into or take a lot of time with. We, we prefer, I receive that in the name of Jesus. We prefer for uh, the preacher to get it over with. But you know what that has produced? That's produced a whole lot of nothing. And so, Amen. I'm making an attempt to make a deposit in your life of something that works in me to impart something to you that I know that God will uh, make alive in your life and break you free in the name of Jesus. You know, there's, there's, a, there's not a whole lot of freedom. There's not a whole lot of freedom that are as good or a lot of freedoms that are quite as good as financial freedom. Do you know you can shout better when you, when you have money in the bank? You can praise longer. You can shout louder. Amen. You'll pray right. <laughs> if, you, if you're a believer and you're really head over heels in love with Jesus and being, doing right in your life, then when you got money in the bank, you'll pray different when you got money in the bank. Because there's some things you ain't going to have to pray about. Amen. So one last time, say it with me. Say God first. Other second, second. self-last. Self last. Amen. 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 How many of you receive that? Amen. So every dime, listen, every dime, every dime you get, that ought to be, that ought to be the question. Lord, what do I do with it? What do you want? What do you want me to do with this? What is it that you desire from me? Is there something that you desire from me? Lord, what can I do? What can I do to be a blessing to someone else? 
Do you know what? You ought to be regularly try to be a blessing to someone else. How many of you ever desired to have something you saw someone else with? You thought, boy, it'd be nice to have that. Not that you were being covetous or it wasn't a, you know, covetousness is, is, is an unhealthy desire for something that someone else has. But, you know, there are some things now, <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen some people uh, that they had some things that I desired, and it wasn't covetousness. It was just a, a healthy desire for something that I thought would be a, a help to me or a blessing to me. Or it was something that I thought was cool, like uh, I'll give you an example. John, he downloaded iOS 7. Now I desire to have that iOS 7. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I think that's, you know, yeah, I'm a geek. You know, I'm a geek. Amy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, my daughter, she says, I'm a bike geek because I like bikes. We go look at bikes, and she's like, Phew. I had to clean out the garage of bikes. I think I told you all that last week. Anyway, so um, there's some things. It's not, it's not wrong to desire something. How many of you know, listen, like Allison, she's in the, the condition she's in presently. We don't expect her to stay in this condition. But, you know, as long as she is in this condition, I reckon that probably she wants to be as comfortable as she can be. I'm certain that she doesn't really want to wheel herself around, you know, like in the old school days, people had to wheel themselves in wheelchair. So she got a fancy joystick here, amen. Got a LCD screen on here, color. I think she got three or four gears in this thing. And uh, so, I mean, so it's a nice thing. It, would, it wouldn't have been wrong for her to desire something nice if she's gonna have to haul herself around for a while in the thing, uh, might as well do it comfortably, might as well have the best she can, she can get. You understand? You, you understand what I mean by that? Amen. So if, you, if there's something you desire in the life of someone else, in, in, instead of trying to get them to bless you with it, <laughs> I had a friend who had this pedal, he's a guitar player, he had this pedal that made different sounds and a, and, a, and a special a band, a worship band, came into their church to, to uh, lead them. And the guitar player saw that pedal, and he's like, man, I would really like that pedal. That would really be a blessing to me and to my ministry. And finally, he just came out, and he said, you should bless me with it, brother. <laughs> and see, that's, that's how a lot of people are. Bless me with it, brother. Bless me with it. Well, you know what? If you've seen something you desire, God, you know, God first, of course, but others second. Man, you ought to you ought to find someone that you can sow into. If there's something you desire that that would be a blessing to you or would be a help to you in someone else's life, then find someone. And you don't you don't have to sow tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, if you could, and if the Lord opens up the door, well, praise God, sow tens of thousands. But if if you could sow something, just something, be like, you know what, I'm sowing. I'm sowing this. I'm sowing this into your business. Because I desire for the Lord to bless me with a business. Amen. I'm sowing this. I'm sowing this into, into this. Or I'm sowing this. You say, do we find believers to sow into? Listen, you ain't got to sow into be just believers. <laughs> Amen. Some of you getting off the bus. <laughs> Praise God. So anyway, God first, other second, self last. So tonight as you, as you hear this word, let it, let it ring in your hearts and in your minds, not just for today, but let this remain in you all the days of your life so that you'll do what, what is expected of you spiritually. And you know what? You say, what if God don't say nothing? Well, then, you're, you know, then just determine in your heart what you're going to do and do that. But determine that you're going you're gonna to be a blessing in the name of Jesus. Say this with me. Say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. in order that I might be a blessing. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now let's lift our hands and thank him for the privilege. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege that you've given us to participate in your ways and in your kingdom. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. All right, then. We'll receive the offering at the end. Someone just remind me, and we'll receive the offering at the end, uh, at the very end of this thing. But open your Bibles with me. And I was going to uh, 
I thought we would go to 10 simple steps, but I can tell we we're not going to get there today. Go to the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy. I'm going to share with you all something that I shared with um, the group of leaders that we had today. Thank you, bro. Got a hole in my lip. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. We started, we started last week a little bit talking concerning spiritual fathers and spiritual sons. And today, as I started talking about, we must be a blessing to the men and the women of God. Of course, the Holy Spirit, he stirred, he stirred it up in my heart again. There's, there's, there's something going on with this. Now, next week we're having an anointing service, and I think that, that um, if we're really going to receive an impartation from the Holy Spirit in the area of the anointing, then we really need to have an understanding of God's word and, and the kind of things that God expects uh, from his people um, in that area of receiving impartation. Now, some people think, well, impartation can be received by anyone. You know, you just step up to the plate and, and let someone slap their hands on your head and, and whatever. But you know, when people were imparted to in the Bible, in Scripture, um, it, was, it, was never, it was never that way. Um, those that were imparted to and those that received the blessing of God through the, through the life of another, they stuck close to those people and, and they, they honored those people. They honored the gift of God that was in those people. So anyway, last week we talked about the book of Ephesians. We talked about the ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, how Jesus gave those gifts unto men, and the purpose that he gave those gifts was to perfect the saints, to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And what we have, what we have desired in these revival meetings here in Richmond, I think more than anything, is for God to equip us to do the work of the ministry, for God to empower us and enable us um, and strengthen us and embolden us and uh, manifest through us, spiritually speaking, uh, the power of the Holy Spirit to persuade a generation to turn their hearts to the Lord Jesus. Amen. So, we, I, I don't know about y'all, but it's my desire for the Holy Spirit to be manifested. Re Brother Ward had a word one time, Pastor Mikey. The Lord spoke to him and said, he said, in the last days, and he was speaking specifically to Brother Ward, but I received it as, as a, something for me. And, and I received it for the whole body of Christ, but I re really received it for me. But he said, he said that the Lord said that he desired and a time would come where the fullness of the manifestation of the Spirit would, would be operating in his life. That there would come a day where the fullness of the manifestation of the operation of the Holy Spirit would be manifested through his life. In other words, the thing that God intended to have manifested through Brother Ward's life would, would be manifested in its fullness. Now... Most of the time in church and in the body of Christ, we see a measure of what God wants to do. We see a measure. In other words, God does as much for us as he can do. You know God will bless you as much as he can? You know what I mean by that? He'll bless you as much as you'll allow him to bless you. And he'll, and he'll, and he'll manifest himself in the measure that you allow him to manifest himself. Now that may not be the full measure. And some people, they're, you know... Um, they, they, it don't take much to satisfy them. I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of like, a, I call them Brill Cream Christians. A little dab will do them. You know what I'm saying? Now, me, a little dab won't do me. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm hungry for the fullness of the flow of God's Spirit in my life. Now, I don't, I don't think I've seen that happen uh, too many times, but in the times that I got close or felt like I was close, some crazy, powerful stuff happened and was manifested through my life. So how many of you desire the fullness? Amen. Amen. So we all do. Um, but, and, but you all understand that most of the time we're just seeing a measure. 
Where's your single measure? I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. One day, I was preaching in a revival in Blackwell, Oklahoma. And while I was preaching, the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he said, he said, it's my desire, he said, uh, to, to anoint these people and to pour out my spirit upon them, to fill them full. He says, if you'll call them forward, he says, I'll fill them full. He says, I'll stir a fresh anointing in their lives. He says, and I'll begin to set them ablaze for the purpose to which I've called them to in these last days. And so I spoke that word. Now, I reckon that if I spoke a similar word in some of these meetings here, or maybe even in this meeting here tonight, if I spoke that word, that I may get the same response that I got out of them people in Blackwell. When I, when I said that, I said, now, if you'll come, I said, how many of you, you'd receive that? And, you know, several lifted their hands. I said, now, if that's you, I want you to come. We're going to lay hands, and when we lay hands, God's going to do that for you. And so I said that, and there were a couple people that, you know, came forward, and, and I stood there, and really, there's even more people in that church that night than there are here tonight, but the place was pretty full. And a couple people came forward, maybe three or four people. And then the fifth person came forward, and she happened to be the youth pastor's wife. And she didn't look like she's a youth pastor's wife. She looked like one of the youth. But she's this little girl, and she said, she said, can I say something? And I said, sure. I didn't expect, uh, I didn't expect what was going to come out of her mouth to come out of her mouth. But she grabbed the microphone, and she said, what's wrong with you people? She said, God said. And she began to say the things that I said. She's like, I know you people, and I know every stinking one of you need exactly what he's talking about, and all y'all are sitting there like bumps on log, acting like y'all don't need nothing, so y'all need to get off your butts and get up here right now. I mean, she got serious. And then she, and she's a little old thing too, and then she handed me the mic back. Well then, you know, a bunch of people came forward. And they all lined up. Well, I laid hands on them, but I'll be honest with you. It wasn't like anything real big time happened. Not what, not what I expected. And you know what? Some people, some people, you know what they think when stuff like that happens? They think, well, you know, the preacher missed it. You know, he was talking all big and look at there, you know. See, I shouldn't even have come. I knew when he said it that it was just a big old ploy, you know, that he is talking, that he was talking out of his neck and this and that and the other, that he wasn't really hearing from God. But after I got done praying for people, and you know, there was some, there was some good things that happened. God blessed, God blessed those people in that line as much as he could. God blessed those people in that line as much as he could. But after, after I prayed for him, the pastor of the church, he came and he, he said, Brother Ziggy, can I say something? I was like, yeah, dude, it's your church. And so he's like, he's like folks, I just want to tell you something. He said, the Lord, he said, wanted to do something far greater here in this place than what he was able to do. He says, in fact, he says, God wasn't even able to do hardly even a fraction of what he really intended to do. And he said, and the reason is, is because of your unwillingness to be receptive to what the Holy Spirit was saying. He said, Brother Ziggy said something. He said it was very clear, very plain. He said, had we responded in a way that would have been um, faith-filled. Filled with an expectation. Now, how many of y'all know that it's hard to get faith-filled and be expectant when... <laughs> what have we been talking about? We've been talking about spiritual fathers, spiritual sons, isn't that right? When you don't have any honor, where you don't honor the individual that you're hearing, when you don't recognize or fully understand the gift of God that's in an individual and the depth of that gift and the breadth of that gift and the height of that gift and the power, the unlimited power that can be manifested as a result of, of uh, putting faith in God. Uh, that he empowered and enabled that gift in an individual. When we, when we don't understand that, then we don't, then we can't expect. When we, when we look at individuals, for example, Pastor King is a pastor of this church. I was saying this this afternoon. 
I know pastors like Pastor Harris and different ones, they'll preach at their church for years and years and years and years. But, you know, after a while, they get up and preach, and it's, and it's almost like, you know, it's almost like doing anything. It's like hanging sheetrock. You know, you go there, and it's, it's, you just do it. You know, it's, it's not like you, you do it, and, and, and there's all this firecrackers and explosions and bombs. And, I mean, you, you, almost, you almost think maybe you ought to try some of that stuff you know, put some uh, explosions and make it like a KISS concert just to get people, you know, to, <laughs> to grab on. But, but you take Pastor King or Pastor Harris or any of these preachers that, are, that have come to these meetings and you take them and you take them someplace where people don't know them and you take them someplace where people don't believe they've tapped them out, where people believe they hadn't heard everything that this person already has to say. You take even Ben. You know, Ben comes here. And he pours his heart out, in, you know, in the area of praise and worship. But you take, listen, you take Ben to my church in Oklahoma City, that brother will come out of there wrung out like a wet rag. I mean, he'll be, he won't be a wet rag no more. He'll be wrung plumb out. We'd wring that brother out. But, you know, some people, it's so common, he's, he's just, you know, some people to him, to them, it's like old hat, you know. And so how are you going to have an expectation? How are you going to be filled with faith? You, do you know, and now some people are like, well, you know, how do you remedy that? Well, you're the only one that can. You're the only one that can. You know, I can't remedy that. I can't fix that in people. Do you know that I, I couldn't fix what was in those people um, if, I, if I wanted to over there in Blackwell? I, c I couldn't make those people be expected. I couldn't make those people rise up in faith. All I could do is preach the word and tell them what God said. It was up to them to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, become expectant, and become faith-filled, and, and, and become radical and, and, and violent, and, get, and, and get their, develop their own urgency in the spirit to receive what God intended for them to receive. But the pastor said, he said, y'all didn't even receive, he said, y'all didn't even receive a, a, a tenth of what God wanted to do in this altar tonight. He said, and he said, and it's not because Brother Ziggy wasn't anointed. He told you what God said. And he says, I reckon that anointing would have been manifested if some people would have come up here fully persuaded that what he was saying was truly of God. If some people had gotten up here faith-filled, amen, amen. He said, but you know what? He said, it didn't happen. And he said, it took, it took the youth pastor's wife coming up here just to get some of y'all to get off your chair and come down. And so he says, y'all half-heartedly came, half-heartedly you received, and, and then you're going to blame the preacher like it was his fault. When you came half-heartedly, amen, amen. <laughs> He said, some people are like, well, if Brother Ziggy would just get anointed, he's like, listen, there's an anointing. There's an anointing in Brother Ziggy's life. He said, that anointing manifests itself. It's, it's, there's a trail that he's left behind. So there's, a, there's an anointing there. But do you know what determines the measure of the anointing that is manifested in these meetings? Don't have anything to do with me and the amount of time I spend in prayer. The amount of anointing that's manifested in, in the church and in churches. in the in the Because some people are like, all oh, the churches in Richmond are dead. The church in Richmond, are, all the churches, all of, they're all dead. My God. Well, you know what? That's not saying much about you because you're the church. And if the church is dead, it's not the preacher's fault. Amen. You're the church. Amen. Come on, somebody. Because I hear people do, ah, the church is dead, the church is dead, the church is dead. Uh -huh. And you're a contributor. You're a contributor to the death of, 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 of the church or to the deadness of the church. Some people say, no, I'm, try I'm, trying to, I'm trying to bring life. But there are things that we can do that will, that will open up that door and cause life to flow. Amen. I may maybe said this last week. Uh, Brother Hagin said, and I, I didn't hear him say it, Pastor Mike heard him say it, but he said there was only a few places, two, two or three places that he could go to 
um, and preach and minister and teach or whatever, where he could go and do his ministry, he said where, he says there was only two or three places he could go in the whole world, and they were in the United States, where he could minister in the fullness of the flow of the anointing that God had placed on his life. He says just a couple places. He's, and one of them, and he, and he came out and he said this, and he said, one of them isn't Rhema. He says, but there, he says, there are other places where I can operate in the fullness of the flow of that anointing. He said, because the people have been, he says, the people have been properly uh, instructed. And not that he said, and the way, you know, the way I figured that he, he was trying to come across was it wasn't some great in-depth teaching. You know, there are some things in, in the church and in uh, that, that pertain to the things of God. There's some things that we are taught, and there are other things that are caught. We're good at being taught. We're, we're, we're good at hearing teachers. We're not, we're not very good catchers. We're not very good catchers. When it comes to catching things, you know, it's, it's, it's better for us if someone comes and give us uh, point one, two, three, step A, B, C. Rather than, rather than them come and say, now, you got to catch this. You got to catch this. Because what does that mean, we got to catch this? Well, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I played baseball, not for very long. My brother was better at baseball than I was. I was never good at any sport. My brother was good at all of them. My brother was a pitcher. He wasn't a belly itcher. Amen. He's a good pitcher. I mean, dude, he could pitch, he could pitch baseball. And uh, because he was so good at it when I was a kid, you know, watching him play, watching my, my family admire him playing, I thought, man, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play baseball too. And so um, I played baseball, I played, uh, <laughs> I played right field. Um, I don't know if you know anything about baseball, but that's where they stick the guy that really stinks. And so that's what, that was the position I played, right field. And um, do you know what I did most of the time in right field? I just daydreamed because there wasn't much, much action in, uh, in right field. And so I, you know, drift and daydream. And, uh, and on the rare occasion that a ball was hit my direction, I remember one time I was struck on the head by a ball. <laughs> I, was struck, I was struck on the head by a ball that I should have, you know, I should have caught. But because I wasn't really paying attention, and I kind of drifted off, you know, and, and uh, um, <laughs> so if you're going to be a good catcher, then you have to be alert. Amen. And it's not, and it's not always easy to be alert and to be on the ready to catch the stuff that God is throwing at us. Amen. But if you're going to be a, if you're going to be good at catching, you have to be ready. You have to be on the ready to catch whatever it is that he's trying to deliver. Amen. And so we have, we, we, of course, we've been gathering now for, for uh, several, <laughs> several months, not too long. <laughs> we've been gathering now, what's this, 38, 37, 37? It's week 37, and, uh, and we, are coming, we are coming to a close. We, we're, these, these meetings, we're getting ready to, we're getting ready to shut the, the meetings down, and uh, we won't be gathering together for too much longer. We will be here for uh, this week and next week, and we may, uh, we, we just don't know how, how the Holy Spirit will lead after this. And you, you say, well, what, what's, what's the reason? Well, just because, amen, because it's, we're done. Amen. And uh, you say, well, you, are you saying that because people are getting off the bus? Well, you know, some people have, but that happens, you know. I, it don't bother me none. Uh, I keep on preaching to as many as will come. When we started out, we had probably this many when we first began. Then we swelled, we stayed swelled for a while. And now, you know, uh, because the summer has come, I think some have drifted off. But I kind of half expected that, you know. The minute some people have something else that they uh, desire to do, that, gets, that goes beyond the desire uh, they, they have for the Lord. Uh, they just follow that. When you're carnal, you can't help it. When you don't walk after the spirit, you'll walk after the flesh. 
And so you can't, you just can't do nothing. If you, if you won't, if you won't get a hold of, of your, if you won't get a hold of your old nature and put it under subjection, you're going to go the way of the flesh. That's just the way that it is. They, people that are in the flesh cannot help themselves. They will go after the flesh. Well, you know, it's been a long time. We, I got things to do. Okay, wonderful. Amen. But the reality is, the reality is, if you in the if you in the spirit and after the spirit, you'll go after the things of the spirit. If you're in the flesh, you go after the things of the flesh. Amen. Get it? Amen. But we're 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 coming to a these meetings are coming to a close. But I I feel like that what God is trying to get across to us is this. There's some things that he wants us to catch that we have not yet caught. In fact, most of what has happened during these meetings is that we've been taught, but there, there, there's still a lot of people that hadn't really caught nothing yet. They've come to a, to, to a greater understanding of what the scripture says and what the Bible says, but as far as catching something, something that will, something that will, um, that will forever affect their lives, something that will, that will be manifested as they continue their pursuit of the Lord and continue their relationship with God. I'm talking about something like what happened, in, and I'll share this very quickly. I'm talking about something like what, and then, and then I'm going to quit, I'm going to turn you loose, and then we're going to come back tomorrow, and I'm going to hit you again. And I mean, I'm not trying to be ugly. I mean, we're going to, I'm going to throw something at you. Amen. And hopefully you'll catch it and not get thumped in the head. <laughs> but one person who has is, who is, uh, always had an influence in my life from the beginning of my walk with the Lord was R.W. Shambach. Shambach, um, first time I heard him preach, <laughs> I thought he was black. He sounded black. But then when I saw him and saw that he was white, I was confused. <laughs> but I still thought he was awesome. He, he tried to dress like a black man. He wore those patent leather Stacy Adams and those purple suits, and, and <laughs> he, really, he really tried to dress like a black man. But R.W. Shambach, when I would listen to him preach, and I listened to him preach, I watched him on video, and received from his ministry. And there was something about, and I, I told you to go to the book of, uh, where did I tell you, Deuteronomy? Forget it, we'll get there tomorrow. But, yeah, we'll go there tomorrow. Deuteronomy. Just tomorrow, just, just, just with your little ribbon there. We'll, we'll go tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, so talking about spiritual, I, I believe Brother Shambach to be one of the spiritual fathers of my life. Because his ministry made an impact. He left a deposit in my life. First through the spoken word off the radio, second through video, and then finally... Oh, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Tyler, Texas, and sit down with Brother Shambach in his office there, and he was sitting there, and of course, he's in his 80s, and uh, me and my wife, we went and we sat down with him, a couple of other preachers, and we got to have some fellowship with R.W. Shambach, and uh, after talking with him and spending some time with him, we got to ask him some questions. It's like, ask him anything you want. I was like, I'm going to. <laughs> Boy, I mean, I'm, I'm asking him questions. Boy, I am and, uh, trying to get some information, trying to, trying to make a pull on the old man. You know what I'm saying? And then after the, uh, the time of questions, we had an opportunity to, uh, to uh, bless Brother Shambach with an offering, which I was intending to do anyhow. And then he, he laid hands on us and prayed a prayer of impartation over us. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There were some that probably came and they had never really followed after his ministry and never, maybe he never really had any kind of influence in their life or anything like that. Listen, you can't really receive impartation from someone who hadn't really had some sort of influence over your life or some measure of influence. Impartation, now you might, you might, get, you might get splashed by their ministry and carry the spots of water on you from the splash you got from their ministry, but that'll dry up and go away. I'm talking about receiving lasting, life-changing impartation from the gift and the anointing of God that's on these people's lives that remains forever. 
And see, that was what I was, that's what I was counting. Now, I didn't know where any of the other people were at. Um, there were a couple other people that were there with us. I didn't know how long they'd been following after his ministry. I didn't really give a rip. I didn't really care about what they were there for or, or whether they would receive anything or not. I, it didn't matter to me. I'm like, I don't care whether y'all get anything or not. I know one thing. I'm getting something. In fact, when we went into the building, they took us into a room and uh, they gave us some uh, bagels for um, breakfast. And we were sitting on these old rickety wooden chairs. And the brother, one of the fellows comes in and says, hey, those chairs that you're sitting in, those used to sit under the tent of uh, Jack Coe. And after those were in Jack Coe's meetings, they were sold to A.A. A. Allen. And they were under A.A. A. Allen's tent for many years. Well, after they were in Brother Allen's tent for years, Brother Shambach purchased them. And these were the chairs that sat under the big tent as Brother Shambach preached. Well, I was like, awesome. So when he walks out, I told Annie, I said, you reckon one of them chairs will fit in your purse? I said, because, yeah, amen, because I'm like, I'm getting one of them chairs. I said, I'm going to take one of the, if I have to, if I have to ask for forgiveness later. <laughs> Listen, I'm, I was serious. I'm like, if I have to ask for forgiveness later, I'm getting one of these stinking chairs. Been under Cove's tent, been under Allen's tent, been under Shambach's tent. I'm getting me one of these chairs. And so Annie's like, don't be crazy. I'm like, listen, I'm getting me one of these chairs. If I have to bribe somebody to get a chair, I'm getting a chair. So eventually, I, you know, they, they, uh, I said, I'll give you an offering for one of them chairs. And they received it, and I walked out with one of them chairs. Got it sitting in my office right now. But uh, uh, it, was, it was way cool, you know. So to, for me, it's like I don't care about any of these other fellas. I don't know where they're at, but I know exactly where I'm at. I have come to receive something that is life-changing. This is not a game for me. This is not an opportunity to take a picture, uh, to put on a website, so I can say, look, I got to hang out with Brother Chef. I could care less who was taking pictures of what. I was about to leave with a part of that man's ministry. I was determined because I'd followed after his ministry and I knew God had something for me through his life. So Brother Shambach, he prayed over my wife and myself. I, I can't say that the angel sang or the lightning flashed and the thunder rolled. But I, I did know this. I did know there was a very awesome and, and sweet anointing that was there in that whole time of impartation. It affected my wife in a big way. My wife had gone there. We were, we, were, we were getting ready to start the church, Winner's Church. She was reluctant. In fact, she told me, she's like, I don't really think that this is right. I don't want to do this. I don't want to have anything to do with being a pastor's wife. And when we left that meeting, all Brother Shambach talked about was establishing churches to us. All he talked about was how God had called him to establish churches, how many churches he had established, how many churches he had pastored, how that he was reluctant to do it, and this and that. Here, My wife sat there, and she cried and bawled, and when we left, she's like, I'm, I'm changed. Something happened to me. She didn't know hardly who Shambach was, except through me, you know. I, I didn't even think she wanted to go. In fact, I thought she was going to bail out last minute. I was going to take my daughter. But we left. We left, that, we left that meeting with Shambach, and it was awesome. Went back to this church that I'd been preaching at. I'd had Shambach lay hands on some prayer cloths, and we handed those out to people uh, for, for impartation. Anyhow, a year goes by, and I'm in a church in, in um, Fort Worth, Texas. And one night, I get up to preach, and that night when I got up to preach, that same anointing that had come on me in that, in that meeting with Brother Shambach came on me that night in that church. And I went to talking to those people. I was like, you know what? That same anointing that came on me when I went and saw Brother Shambach and he laid hands on me, I said, that anointing is here right now. And the Lord's telling me, the Lord spoke some stuff to me that night concerning my ministry while I was preaching. I mean, God was blessing me big time. I don't know if he blessed anybody else big time. He blessed me big time, though. Well, he did. I, it was a good night. But I, pre I preached. I gave some testimonies about Shambach's ministry. And that night, I began to pull people out and lay hands on the sick. We began to have, well, we had a lady that, that got up out of a, uh, got up off some crutches that had had surgery on her knee and went to walking and dancing around. I mean, we, we had some powerful miracles happen that night. So we, I slapped some people on the head like Brother Shambach. That anointing was there. I mean, I, was, I did. I slapped a couple people on the head. It was, it was powerful. 
His power, and it wasn't just because I slapped people. It was, that anointing was manifested. And I remember, I remember wondering, wow, this is, this is awesome. And I'm talking with the pastor. We, we got done with the service. We're going to grab something to eat. And as we're in the car driving, um, I was like, man, I said, that anointing that, had, that was on me when Brother Shambhal, I said, man, that, that's that same anointing was in the meeting tonight. I said, I'm, I'm still feeling that anointing right now. And right then my phone um, made a sound, you know, got a text message. And the text message was from my nephew, Tyler. And in the text message, he said, Brother Shambach passed away this evening. And so the night that Brother Shambach had passed away, there was a, there was a, a, a surge of what had been transferred and what had been imparted into my life. It was supernatural. It was supernatural. Do you know, I reckon that as long as, as long as I'm preaching the gospel and I have any influence over people, the ministry of R.W. Shambach will still continue to influence people, even if it's in a small way, you know. I know some people think, who do you think you are? Well, I know who I am. Amen. And I'm, and I'm telling you, I know the ones that God has set in my life that have, that have left a mark and made an impact. You say, well, why are you, why are you telling us this, Brother Ziggy? Well, because there are some of you that God wants to leave a mark in your life, yes, amen. and he wants to make an impact. But you're not going to get it just through what you're taught here. We've been through the teaching. We've gone through the taught. And the time has come for some of us to get alert and begin to prepare ourselves to catch some of the things that God's trying to throw at us and hit us with. Amen. I receive that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now see, that had, that had, a, that had a, a pull. Amen. Now that had a pull. And that's, see, that's what I'm, that's what I really, that, that's, that's been my hope all along in these meetings is that people would make a pull and that they would catch a flow of the Spirit. Now, thank God that many have heard the Word and been willing to hear and receive the Word of God preached and taught. But you know, there, um, I, was telling, I was telling these fellows that, that I talked to and, and ladies in the back today, not one person in the whole 30-some-odd weeks of meetings that I've been here has said, you know what, Brother Ziggy, there's an anointing on you and in you to minister to people that need fillings in their teeth. I'm making a pull on that anointing so that that can be manifested through my life and I can go and lay hands on people and have them get fillings in their teeth. Wouldn't that be awesome to have an outbreak of filling, fillings in people's teeth in the city of Richmond? But you know what? Not one person has been like, I'm, I'm pulling. Amen. That anointing that you're carrying, I'm, I'm pulling on it. You say, well, that can't. Brother Z, you can't do that. I was in Paul's Valley, Oklahoma. I, a fella had invited me to his church. It was called Faith Cathedral. His name was Andrew Soto. He, uh, he had asked me to come. I told him I would. Um, There's one of the only meetings my crusade coordinator at the time hadn't scheduled. I scheduled it myself. Um, I remember going out to Paul's Valley, Oklahoma, and driving around trying to find the church and couldn't find it. We drove by it several times and realized it was the church, but the church, it was, it was eighth, eighth, eighth Cathedral. You know, the, the F had come off the, uh, had come off the sign. And, and uh, it got blown off by the wind or something. I was like, well, I reckon that's it, even though it doesn't have the F. And so we pulled into the parking lot and went into the church, and there were a whole six people in this church. My crusade court, in fact, I brought more people with me than there were actually members in the church. My crusade coordinator caught me in the parking lot as I got out of the car late and said, remember, you scheduled this meeting. I didn't. He says, because there are more of us than there are of them. I was like, that don't make no difference to me. I said, I know God told me to come here. I walked in the door, and I mean, literally, the door to the church was just like this one. I walked in the door, and the pastor was like, well, there's Brother Sanchez now. Come on, Brother Ziggy, here. I mean, I walked from the parking lot up to the platform to preach. And so I had the microphone in my hand, and I'm looking over these people, and, and I'm trying to determine what the Lord would have me to do because I hadn't had time to shift gears yet. And, and I was like, what do I do, Lord? And, that's what, and then he asked me that back. He says, well, what are you going to do? I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? He says, he, says, that's not the, he says, that's not the question. He says, the question is, what are you going to do? 
I was like, well, there's not many here. There are more of us than there are of them. And he said, so what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach to these people. I'm going to get them set free. Amen. We're going to get them over in the Holy Ghost. And so I proceeded to preach to those people as if there was a million people in that building. I mean, I preached like a house on fire and laid hands on those people, called them out. I prophesied over every one of them. There weren't that many of them. Amen. So I prophesied over every one of them. They got laid out on the floor under the power of God. Then I went after the people I brought with me. Amen. Got them laid out. Before that meeting was over with, that, that, that church more than doubled in size. Amen. Thank God. It wasn't a hard thing to do, but that church more than doubled in size. But here's the thing about this pastor. After I got done preaching that morning, he said, he said this to me. He said, in front of everybody, he said, now, he said, thank God we've had a move of God here. and We're going to be back here tonight for the next couple of days. But he said, I just want to say, he says, I just want to get this out of the way. He said, Brother Ziggy, I have heard that there's an anointing that has worked in your life to minister to people that need fillings in their teeth. He said, is that right? I said, yes, sir. He says, I want that. He says, as a matter of fact, you're not getting out of here until I get it. He says, because I've had an ulterior motive for these meetings all along. He says, I didn't want you here for, for my church. He says, I just wanted to get you here long enough where I could pull on that anointing and get it working in my ministry. I said, well, here's the thing about that. He said, you don't have to tell me nothing. He says, I don't care. He says, I don't care how it works. It don't make no difference to me. He said, all that matters is that you have been touched by the Holy Spirit in that way at one time in your life. He said, if you've been touched one time in your life, he says, there's a residue of it in your life. It's still there, and I aim to get it. Well, here's, here's, here's what's funny, is that before, before he had done this, he had called out one of the fellows that was with me before he had said this. He called out, one, and he said to my, my friend, he said, the Lord tells me, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. And, he, and of course, my friend broke down. He, he says, and he gives him a word, well, my, uh, my friend's uh, son was just, he was just born about a month or two earlier, and his son's name was Samuel. And he hadn't been able to see his son. In fact, I'm not sure he's seen his son yet, but, but it, was, it was the word of the Lord. So, and then the pastor had said, well, God's used me many times to give names. So when he said, I'm going to get that anointing for uh, fillings, I looked at him, I said, well, you know what? If you're getting the anointing for fillings, I'm getting the name calling anointing in the name of Jesus. And so I said, he said, well, we might as well get this done. Listen, this is exactly how it played out. He says, well, we might as well get this done right now. I was like, might as well, amen, let's get it out the way. We laid hands on one another. We both hit the floor under the power of God and both determined that we'd received, amen. When I got off the floor, I looked at a woman and I said, I said, now, I see a young man, and I see the name, I can't remember the name, I'll just make one of his Hispanic name, Javier. I said, what does that mean to you? Well, she started to shout. She said, that's my son. And the pastor says, that's my nephew. I said, well, the Lord says this, and, and I mean, right immediately, he began to work. He said, and, and the pastor was like, oh, he said, if, that, if it's working for you already, he says, that means it's working for me too. Glory to God. And he started to shout. Well, we had that revival meeting, and I went on, and a week later, I get a phone call from this fella. After that meeting we'd had with him, he had, been, he had had a revival meeting scheduled in Missouri. You know what that guy did? He went to, he went to St. Louis, Missouri. The, uh, the pastor introduces him to the congregation. This is the first meeting in the series of meetings that they're going to have. He doesn't preach. He doesn't, he doesn't introduce himself. You know what he does? He says, he gets up, the pastor gives him the mic, he says, if you're here and you need fillings in your teeth, you're about to get fillings in your teeth right now. He said, it's about, I mean, he just got out there. And he, he called me from the meeting. While people are getting fillings in their teeth, he calls me. He said, Brother Ziggy, I just wanted to call you and tell you it's working. People are getting fillings in their teeth in this meeting. Well, you know what? You don't teach people that. That's not something that is taught. That's something that is caught. 
And it's not something that you're just going to catch by daydreaming in right field with your head down, hoping that a pop fly comes and lands in your glove. Amen. Well, you know what? That's what we're going to hit. Tomorrow, we're going to hit it. Amen. Well, that's what I was trying to get to tonight, but I want to, we're going to ease into it here. Amen. Because, listen, by the time we hit next Wednesday, ooh. Now, see, you say, well, can't you just do it now? No. Because if I, listen, I said we having an anointing service next Wednesday, and some of you having a hard time getting inspired about next Wednesday. And then some of you can't wait, Amy. Get it there. But you know, you know what I'm saying? We got different people in different places. And I want to, listen, I, I, what I'm attempting to do here and what I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to do is to prepare you so that you will not let this get past you. Because, because these meetings are coming to an end. And I'm going to leave out of here. And when I leave, what I have, I'm taking with me. Oh, yes, I am. Yes, I am. What I have, I'm taking with me. Unless there are some of you that determine that you're getting a hold of some of it. And you're going, listen, and not just get a hold of it so you can be all, ooh, in this wonderful. But you get a hold of it so that you can continue the pursuit of what God has already determined in his own heart and his own mind to do here in the city of Richmond. You know what? God didn't intend for me to touch this city. God intended for you, anointed by his spirit and empowered by the Holy Ghost, to touch this city. See, some have, some have hoped that one day they'd come in here and the entire city of Richmond would show up. But that wasn't the heart and the idea and the intentions of God. God's plan was to equip you and to empower you and to anoint you. You know, the very thing I've been trying to get across to my people at my church, I think I'm going to have to try to start convincing people on the road as well. I'm trying to convince my people that the ministry, the church, is not built on my ministry, Winner's Church. And you know what? People, they'll gather for a season around someone's ministry when they're all excited about it. And if you market it right, you know, I mean, I reckon if we marketed this thing well, we could really still, you know, draw out a crowd. We could really get, a, we could probably get a big crowd, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't have what we have here right now. I mean, tonight, I think we're going farther tonight than we have in a lot of meetings. <sighs> but you know what? Some people, they still looking to me. Now, thank God, there is something that needs to, you, there is some recognition and some understanding you need to have about the role that I play and about what can be offered to you as a result of me being here and the anointing that's on my life. But, uh, revival isn't determined by my presence in this city. That's not what determines revival. Revival is determined by your willingness to catch and to receive and to carry and to allow what God has sent through us and through my ministry to impact your life. Listen, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to we're going to quit and I'm going to send you out of here. I like you cuz you're well, see I, there's a bunch of you here that you're already you're already over there big time. And thank God for it. Amen. Listen, when you touched my hand, when you gave me that offering, something happened. Something happened. And see, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm looking for. Now, some people, they just want to do it. Okay, I'm going to try it and see if it works. No, th there's something that has to happen. There's a connection that has to be made. There's a, there's a drawing close that has to happen. There's a change of mind, a, ch a change of the way you see uh, uh, things, the way you see the gift of God, the way you honor the gift of God. The way you believe the word of God. Something, something has to shift. Something has to change. 
Because it's only, it's only in, that, in that place that, that the deposit is made, that the transfer is made, that the, <laughs> that the impartation, that the handoff happens. I don't know how many people are coming from Oklahoma City, but they're coming. They're people that are taking their vacation to come to Richmond. They are. They're like, I, I told you, I'm like, y'all ought to come. They're like, they're doing everything they can. There's some of them that are so desperate to get here. I had one, one lady, she's desperate. She's desperate to get here. She's, I want to come so bad, Pastor. I'm, I'm doing everything I can to try to get there. Pastor Ward's gonna be here. I believe his wife's gonna be here. His, some, of, some of the people in it, uh, some, I think maybe his daughter is coming. I know his little one's coming if, if Pastor Sneak doesn't get to, but they're doing, they're doing all they can. People are doing all they can. David, uh, uh, Hilda and her husband David are coming. Joe is coming. Um, huh? uh, John, we're, we're, Steve, John's working on it, man. There are lots of people trying to get here for that, for that anointing service because they know something's getting ready to happen. And so, I, I don't want, I'm, I'm not trying to tell y'all, now, I don't believe that the meetings will be done during in that morning service. In fact, uh, I, I, I need to talk to pastors just get, just tell them what I'm feeling in my heart. But I, I, do, I do believe that I have a, I know that we're, we're, we're coming to an end. There, there's, a, there's a time, and if there's something in my heart it says, this is it. And so as soon as, as soon as I talked, we haven't even had a chance to talk. I got off the airplane, we had a meeting, I went back to the room, we, we pressed the pedal, we came back to church, we haven't even spoken. So, but we, we still have, we still have some time. But I want to, I want to make sure that we don't miss, because he wants us to have that anointing meeting next week. We don't want to miss this is not this this is not a uh, this is not a gimmick. This is not something we're doing to attract the crowd or to kill time. Ministries will be launched. Gifts will be uh, stirred up. There will literally be people that will walk away from that night with God having given them a gift. Amen. There's something prophet now. After those at that anointing service now, I don't know how this will play out, but we're going to have a week of prophetic, of a prophetic, I don't even know what to call it. The Lord said we're going to have a week of the prophetic, that the, uh, that the prophetic is going to be a manifestation. And you know what the Lord told me about that time? The Lord told me that he is going to equip ministry gifts with the gift of seeing. <laughs> Prophetic now. I have never heard that before. I have never heard it not one time. In fact, if you'd have told me that he was going to say that to me and that I'd get up here and say it, I'd have thought that's just plain stupid. I'd never say that. I don't, I don't even believe that. But you know what? When God goes to saying stuff, you just have to receive it. Amen. But that's what I heard the Lord say. I heard the Lord say that it's his desire to bring a supernatural prophetic uh, insight to ministry gifts and to those that are called into ministry into this region. And so shortly after that, we're, but there, there are deposits being made. We have, we have come to the point in these meetings where there's going to be some teaching and you're going to be taught, but more than anything, there are going to be things that need to be caught. And so let's ready ourselves. How many of you will commit with me to ready yourself? for what God's getting ready to do in this place. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. We cannot allow anything to distract us and to keep us from what he has for us in the days that are coming. Thank God. Lift up your hands with me one time. Stand, in fact, stand up all over the place. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Thank God. Yeah, we need to receive the offering. <laughs> Thank God. Amen. I receive that, brother, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I receive that in the name of Jesus. I receive that in the name of Jesus. 
how to be that to be in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God. I receive that in the name of Jesus. I receive that, my brother, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. I receive that, my brother, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Boy, how many of y'all sense the same urgency that I do? Amen. Listen, don't, uh, uh, now, I, I sense that there's some people, too, they're, they're starting to get a, we're going, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, 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 a sadness. There's almost like a time of mourning. And <clears throat> some of y'all, you've been sensing something, you hadn't been able to put your finger on it. Uh, some people have been like, yeah, I don't know, man, it's just like a, like a weightiness or a burden. But it isn't like any burden you've carried before. It's just the knowing that a season and a time is coming to a close. And, uh, and there is a, a, a measure of what I call sadness or whatever that comes with it. But don't allow yourself to get overrun with that burden. Of, this, is, this, is not, this is not a sad time. God has blessed us big time. Do you know how many people would give their right arm and right leg to have been a part of what, what we've been a part of here in this, this season of time? I receive you, Allison, in the name of Jesus. God, he's blessed us so much with all that he's been doing. And there's, there's still some yet to come. But I just want to make sure that you, listen, get happy. It's your turn now. It's your turn now. It's your turn now. Turn to someone and tell them it's your turn now. Amen. Your turn to prosper. It's your turn to heal the sick. It's your turn to cast out devils. It's your turn to raise the dead. It's your turn to shake a city. Amen. It's your turn now. Amen. Listen, if you have an offering, lift it up. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that you've given us to sow tonight. I pray, God, that as your people give, you'll bless them big time. Exceeding abundantly above all they could ask or even think. Lord, I pray that your people will be obedient in their, in their giving, in their offerings. And that, Lord, as they obey and do as you command them to do, as we've taught tonight, Lord, that you'll cause the windows of heaven to be opened and blessing to be poured out. There's not room enough to receive. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and receive the offering. Amen. This, uh, there's a lady over here. I keep, she keeps sticking out to me. This lady, she got a, I received that in the name of Jesus. She's got a, a blonde hair, looks like a dark maybe black uh, shirt yes come over here right quick <clears throat> praise God where are you from from here in Richmond and uh, what church you go to full gospel chapel who your son is the pastor what's his name Matthew Smith awesome Lord, I thank you. God, I pray the Holy Spirit to be poured out on this lady from top of her head to the soles of her feet. Lord, fill her full. Your word declares you give us times of refreshing. Lord, I pray for a great refreshing from the Holy Ghost in her life tonight. Kele Suda Mangarajaya. this to you? Who is this to you? That's your mother-in-law. So, you're the pastor's wife or no? No? Come over here then, right quick. Huh? The other brother. <laughs> Lift up your hands to the Lord Jesus. What's wrong? Is there something wrong with you? I'm just nervous. So this is different for you. Where do you go to church? But this is, this is different for you. Amen. 
even though you joined the full gospel tabernacle, it's a little bit strange. Now, amen. Lord, I thank you. I hear God saying that he's going to, amen, thank God. I hear God saying he's going to reveal himself to you, not, not just here tonight. But I hear the Lord saying that there are days that you're going to be caught up in his presence so that you can see him. I hear God saying that, I hear God saying you've heard, it's almost like you've heard the stories and saw the movie, but you never had the encounter. And I hear God saying, Tonight, the encounters will begin. Uh, now, that's good. Yes, amen. Amen. Now, I want you all to know something. There are a lot of people have not yet encountered God's spirit up in here. We got to be careful that we don't we don't think this thing is common because just because it listen just because we don't have a bunch showing up here tonight that don't mean nothing. That doesn't mean a thing. You know how Azusa went for year for for a long time. I mean Azusa for a long time they never they never had big giant crowds or anything like that. In fact they never did. Uh, amen. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Lord, give her double dose. <laughs> double dose in the name of Jesus. Three days drunk in the Holy Ghost. Three days drunk in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I thank you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Well, amen. Oh, I'm so glad you guys came tonight. You know, I believe God brought people here tonight that needed to be here. People that needed to hear this word. People that needed to be provoked to that higher place. Amen. come into agreement. God, we come into agreement with all of heaven. We come into agreement with your word. Father, we refuse to step out of that place of agreement with what you said. God, we thank you. We thank you for all that you've said concerning healing and health and wholeness. We thank you, Lord, that you're quickening and making alive parts of Allison's body that the doctors have declared are dead. But we know the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives and dwells on the inside of her. And we have a promise from your word, Lord, that you'll quicken her mortal body. And so, Father, we don't, we don't even have to yell or scream at it. All we got to do is rejoice that you're not a liar. That everything you said is true. And so, we line ourselves up with your word. And we declare a quickening and a making alive of Allison's mortal body. Strength. 
where she's had no strength. Health where she's had no health. Wholeness, God, where she's been broken. We thank you for it, Father, in the name of Jesus. We, we agree with her. Amen. We agree in the name of Jesus. With her and with you. We call it done by faith in your name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, you know what? I love you. I know I, know I haven't done much here tonight. And as far as calling people out or ministering to you one-on-one, -on -one, but we're going to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. And I really want you to really, really make a pull like never before. Tomorrow night now, you, I know some of you, you, you'll be going to your home churches and whatnot, but I want to encourage you to get here just as quick as you can after you out of there and come. We're going to uh, talk about this. Maybe we'll get into here in the Deuter book of Deuteronomy, but let's come with expectation. Let's invite as many as we can um, to come and be a part. Some of you say, man, I'm trying. Just keep on. Amen. Just keep letting them know, but uh, let's keep pursuing him and expecting the best is yet to come. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you not only for your word, but we thank you for the anointing and for the touch of your spirit that's in this house tonight. And God, I thank you. I thank you for these people. These, the core, the foundation. God, the ones who have had ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to a community. God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, for those that have determined to hear from heaven and to receive, God, of that that you're tossing, that that you're throwing, that, God, that you're releasing. And so, Lord, we, we will come with more and greater expectation. We'll pull. We're not going to let you out. We're not going to let you out of what you've said. We will receive in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you in advance. Because we know by faith that we're already on track to be hit with the freight train of the blessing of your anointing. In Jesus' name. And everybody that believed it shouted amen. 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 Listen, I love you. We're back here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, tomorrow morning, 10.30 a.m. Come be a part over at Bethesda, 10.30 a.m. We'll see you tomorrow morning, tomorrow night. God bless you. Go in his presence before you leave. Love someone because you do. Amen.